As you have heard and heard and heard, my presentation for this evening is entitled Poetic Craftsman. In the course of this presentation, I invite you to explore three times the fruits of Freemasonry through the eyes of several men who were renowned for their skill with words, for their practice of the craft of poetry. And these are instances where they turn their talents upon our craft. Now, Masons do words pretty darn well. We have volumes of words passed down for hundreds of years. Skilled men, sometimes we have a little bit of a hard time in this modern era reading that language because we don't talk that way anymore. But nevertheless, a lot of wisdom has been reduced to writing in many different ways. But tonight we're going to focus specifically on poets who were also Masons and who turned their life upon our beloved craft. Now I'm going to do this a little differently from the way I would present a formal paper. We've got three guys, we've got three broad topics, and I'm going to let you choose the order in which we do it. We can explore brotherly love with the aid of the hottest Scottish songwriter of the 80s, the 1780s. <laughs> We can explore relief with the aid of a poet of the American West, acclaimed as the pioneer poet, that was his nickname from his peers, who also later became the Grand Master of Masons in Colorado. Our third selection is to explore truth with the aid of the winner of the 1907 Nobel Prize for Literature. And to this day, he is still the youngest person ever so honored. So what shall we have, brethren, companions? Brotherly love, relief, or truth to start with? Brotherly love. I hear brotherly love. Is there a second? There. Let's go for it. Brotherly love first. If I could enlist some assistance in passing these out, just so you've got it. Although I was, that won't stop me from starting to talk. The poem is Farewell to the Brethren of St. James's Lodge, Carleton. And it's by Robert Burns, which is a name that may be familiar to you in literary studies. He's actually, I've described him as a a hot Scottish songwriter. You know, one of his hits still charts every New Year's. Robert Burns is the man who wrote the words for Old Lang Syne. And to have your song be sung worldwide a couple hundred years later, that's not a bad, not a bad legacy to leave. But in this particular instance, uh, Brother Burns was in dire straits. He had always been a fairly poor man and a subsistence farmer and a little bit of a writer, but it was hard. It was just now, at this point, ironically, that he started to break through. But the poem here is his farewell to the men that were his lodge brothers because he was going to have to go away to earn a living and try and break the cycle of poverty that he'd been living in. Farewell. Adieu, a heart warm fond of you, ye dear brothers of the mystic top. Ye favored, ye enlightened few companions of my social joy. Though I to foreign lands must hide, pursuing fortune slid me by, with melting heart and grimful eye, I'll mind you still, O far away. Oft have I met your social band and spent the cheerful festive night. Oft, honored with supreme command, presided o'er the sons of life. And by that hieroglyphic bright which none but craftsmen ever saw, strong memory on my heart shall write those happy scenes in far away. May freedom, 
harmony and love unite you in the grand design. Beneath the omniscient eye above, the glorious architect divine. That you may keep the unerring line still rising by the plummet's wall, till order bright completely shine, shall be my prayer. When far away. And you, farewell, whose merits claim justly that highest badge to wear. Heaven bless your honored noble name to masonry and Scotia dear. A last request permit me here. When yearly ye assemble all one round, I ask it with a tear to him, the bar that's far away. This is a man who above all else loved his brethren. He served his brethren. We see a reference in here to his time as master, off honored the supreme command itself. We see symbols in here. He encourages and exhorts to his brethren to live the plumb law. A plummet is the name for the actual thing on the bottom. What we sometimes know as a plumb bottom these days. Some of the words get a little tricky, not too bad. I've got notes at the bottom. I don't need to go over all of them. Uh, but Burns wrote a lot in dialect. He, as a matter of fact, some of the stuff that he did in the Scottish lowlands has been recognized by later scholars as almost a distinct Scottish language, separate from cognate to akin to English. But he would slide back and forth from almost perfect King's English to dialect that was so thick that it was really hard to understand. And the world has been blessed because he didn't really need to make his farewell. He made the farewell, but about that time, his first book started to sell. And started to sell well enough that he didn't need to leave his beloved homeland. He only had another 11 or so years of life. He died young, but he left his mark. If any of you have anything you want to say or observations you want to make after this poem or after either of the other two, please feel free to do so. I don't have to go uninterrupted through this whole thing. And if you've got questions, that's fine. I want it to be a little more informal and not just a me stand up and recite. So why did you pick Burns? What attracted you to him? Well, I looked at Burns because of my exposure to one of the other poems that I'll be presenting tonight. The one that I was exposed to first got me looking at the subject of Masonic poetry in general. And I, I stumbled across a 1924 edition of the MSA's Book of Masonic Poems. And that broadened my scope. And the three that I'm presenting tonight are three of my favorites. And they're organized in a way to echo brotherly love, relief, and truth, and so forth. But I, I came to Burns in the Masonic context because of my exposure to another poem. Without further ado, then let's go ahead. Relief for truth. Really? Let's you really okay, we'll just do them straight down the list in order. I was looking for a little more originality, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Can I? Oh, thank you. Now, this poem of the three was written by the man who has the most Masonic history of the three poets. Lawrence M. Greenleaf was made a Mason in Boston in the 1860s. But within the year, he affiliated with a lodge in Denver, Colorado. And he would write more than 50 years of Masonic history in that era. 
Brother Greenleaf became Grand Master of Masons of Colorado in 1880. He was a Grand Master, excuse me, he was a Grand High Priest of the Royal Arts Chapter in Colorado about five years later. He was a 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite. Honorary first, the year he served as Grand Master, and then several years later he became Deputy Inspector General for Colorado and served as an active 33rd for a better part of three decades. A man who had a very, very rich Masonic history. And this poem is on the Colorado Grand Lodge website. It's been published in their newsletters and in their proceedings and so forth for years. There is a lodge in Colorado that has actually erected a lodge room in the fashion that we will be describing in the poem as a memorial and as a Masonic Museum. Presenting the Lodge Room over Simpkins Store, a poem from 1898 by Lawrence N. Greenleaf, past Grandmaster. The plainest lodge room in the land was over Simpkins Store. As a matter of fact, it might well have been this one before the upgrade. Where friendship lodged in Maggie's Monk for 50 years or more. When o'er the earth the moon full orb had cast its brightest beams. The brethren came from miles around on horseback and in teams. And oh, what hearty grasp of hand! What welcome met them there as mingling with the waiting groups they slowly mount the stair, exchanging fragmentary news or prophecies of crop until they reached the Tyler's room and current topics drop to turn their thoughts to nobler themes they cherish and adore and which were heard on meeting night of Overson Pinstone. To city eyes, a cheerless room, long usage had defaced the telltale lines of lathe and beam on wall and ceiling trays. The light from oil-fed lamps was dim, yellow in its hue. The carpet once could pattern boast, though now it was lost to view. The altar and the pedestals that marked the station's three, the post-gate pillars topped with ball, the rude carved letter G, were village joiners' clumsy work, with many things beside where beauty's lines were all effaced, an ornament denied. There could be left no lingering doubt, if doubt there was before. The plainest lodge room in the land was over. While musing thus on outward form, the meeting time grew near, and we had glimpse of inner life through watchful eye and ear. When Lodge convened at Gavel Sound with officers in place, we looked for strange conglomerate work, but could no errors trace. The more we saw, the more we heard, the greater our amaze to find these country brethren so skilled in Mason's way. But greater marvels were to come before the night was through. Where unity was not a mere name, but fell on heart like doom. Where tenets had the mind imbued, and truths rich fruitage bore. In the plainest lodge room in the land of Overstreet. To hear the record of their acts was music to the ear. We sing of deeds unwritten which on an angel scroll appear. A widow's case, four helpless ones. Lodge funds were running low. A dozen brethren sprang to feet, and others were not slow. Food, raiment, things of needful sort, while one gave load of wood, another shoes for the ones, for each gave way to them. Then spake the last, I have things like these to give, but then some ready money may help out. And he laid down a tent were brother cast on darkest square upon life's checkered floor, a beacon light to reach the white was over in store. The faded car, excuse me, like scoffer who remained to pray, impressed by light and sound. 
The faded carpet beneath our feet was now like holy ground. The walls that had such dingy look were turned to celestial blue. The ceiling changed to canopy where stars were shining through. Bright tongues of flame from altar leaped. The G was vivid blaze. All common things seemed glorified by heaven's reflected rays. A wondrous transformation wrought through ministry of love. Behold the lodge room beautiful, fair type of that above. The vision fades, the lesson lives, and taught as ne'er before in plainest lodge room in the land over some storm. This one it's hard to read without choking up. It's just a sublime expression of the Masonic value of religion. And of course, the attentive brother will note how Brother Greenleaf describes in the second stanza the plain, drab, lodge room, small town lodge room up on the floor where you have to go up the stairs to get to it. And all of the, we've seen those, we live that. The lodge room is more than that. And next time you get a chance, look at or call to memory, depending on how proficient your ritual is. The, ritual, the lectures in the Enterprise and Fellow Prep degrees. And note how he makes the transition between elements of physical lodge room and the elements of the spiritual lodge room. Also, I did a little bit of research. And there are different formulas for computing it, but that last brother that laid down a 10, that's about 300 bucks in modern terms, purchasing power between 1898 and 2016. So we're talking about men by implication. If you're reading that at the time, men who truly gave it their substance. Does anybody else have any observations or questions, comments before we move through? Then in that case, we have but one more. This is a reflection on truth. This poem is the one that caused me to want to study Masonic poetry, specifically. It happens to be a poem by one of my two or three favorite poets. But it didn't mean that much to me until I received the degrees of Mason. And oddly enough, I was junior deacon in my lodge when I first encountered this, which will become, it'll become apparent by that significant as we go through. The poet is Rudyard Kipling. He of Jungle Book fame, his most famous poem is If. Um, he had an active career as a writer for 50 years. He was the, often described as the poet of the British Empire because he captured that era perhaps more and more strongly than any other person. And Kipling was made a Mason in a lodge in Lahore, India, which at that time was part of the British Empire, and which is now in Pakistan and in a place where Masons can't work because of religious strife. But Kipling is said to have, well, well actually he did say at one point that he was initiated by a Hindu, passed by a Mohammedan, and raised by an Englishman. That was the kind of mix of student <coughs> cultures that was present when he became a Mason. And I'll tell you up front, the poem's narrator is a character, Tommy Atkins, who is a British soldier of the lower classes, and he shows up in a couple of volumes of poetry that were devoted to military poetry. And Tommy Atkins is sort of the focal point. 
because Kipling wrote eloquently of the common people. And Tommy's telling the story here, but he's, he's a Mason, and he's proud of it, and he's glad to be proud of it. And no, I'm not going to attempt a British accent. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. <laughs> However, the poem is The Mother Lodge, written in 1896 by the 1907 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, Dr. Kidd. There was Rundle, station master, and Beasley of the Rail, and Acton, commissariat, and Duncan of the Jail, and Blake, conductor sergeant, a master twice was he, with him that kept the Europe shop, old Fram G. Edelgy. Outside, sergeant, sir, salute, salam. Inside, brother, and it doesn't do no harm. We met upon the level, and we parted on the square, and I was junior deacon in my mother lodge up there. We bowl and that accountant and saw the aiding Jew, and did Muhammad, draftsman of the survey office, too. There was Babu Chucker Buddy, and Amr Singh, the chief, and Castro from the fitness shed, the Roman Catholic. We had a good regalia, and our lodge was old and bare, but we knew the ancient landmarks, and we kept them to air. And looking on it backwards, it often strikes me thus there ain't such things as infidels, except perhaps it's us. For monthly, after labor, we'd all sit down and smoke. We durstn't give no banquets, lest the brothers cast were broke. And man on man got talking religion and the rest, and every man comparing the guy who the best. So man on man got talking, and not a brother stirred till morning waked the parrots and that damn brain fever bird. We'd say it was highly curious, and we'd all ride home to bed with Muhammad, God, and Shiva changing pickets in our head. Full off on government service, this roving foot the pressed and bore fraternal greetings to the lodges east and west, according to his command, from Baha to Singapore. But I wish that I might see them in my mother lodge once more. I wish that I might see them, my brethren, black and brown, with the tricky smell and pleasant, and the hog darn passing down. The old Kansama snoring in the bottle kind of floor, like a master in good stand, with my mother lodge once more. Outside, sergeant, sir, salute, salam. Inside, brother, and it doesn't do We met upon the level, and we parted on the square. And I was junior deep in my mother lodge out there. Categorizing this one as true, well, this poem is a reminder to a 21st century American Freemason that the fraternity is not a white fraternity. It is not solely a Christian fraternity. It is far more multicultural and far more universally applicable than we are sometimes exposed to in this place and time. I always found it interesting that they talked about religion, which is something that we tend to avoid, although the, the prohibition against it is, of course, only in the lodge. And note that they talked about all of this fun stuff after labor, not as part of labor. And they talked about it as friends and brothers. And they had a good time doing it, apparently. I don't know that I would smoke as much as they did, but it was part of their fellowship, part of their brotherly love, if you will. And each of those men learned from the others. Different ways, different thoughts. Same grand architect. This is my favorite Masonic poem. Although Simpkins' store runs a close second. Because 
it exposes us to a picture of Freemasonry that is radically different from our own and yet rooted in the same honorable principles. The continuity of the craft is established, but it's been known throughout the world in different ways. Brethren, thank you for being an attentive audience. If any of you have any questions you'd like to ask or comments you'd like to make before we close, Looking at me, but nobody's coming. No, I think, first of all, I'd like to say you've done a really good job in putting this together, and I find it extremely interesting. <clears throat> I think all of these poems, especially the last two, I think, or I think as you alluded to, a reminder, a very good reminder of um, that masonry is much more universal and a good reminder of the way things used to be. You know, the Simpkin Store poem mentions the fact that the brother came on horseback and you know, I'm assuming this is probably what I've heard referred to as a moon lodge, possibly where they met by the, whenever the moon was full. Yes. And that was kind of back in the days when you didn't have the communications and there was a rural area and that's how people knew it was time to move a lodge, but you know, can you imagine today if you were trying to get people to come out on horseback and travel a great distance? I did, I, it's, it's a good reflection of the dedication and the, uh, the honor that was placed in masonry that we haven't always carried on as well as we should have, I think. I thank you for those observations, and there are certainly other things to be gleaned reading it. It's made me realize just how timeless masonry is. Mm -hmm. Different people, different eras, different ways of life, but it's the concepts are all the same as they were mm -hmm. a long time ago. Yeah, we've got three brethren there writing in three different parts of the world, more than a century apart, and more than a century removed from us. That common thread is there. But the mystic tie, the bar our own brother Burns' words, that ties us all together. No matter what, what problems are going on outside, everything changes and same in here. Mm -hmm. now, Come in here that's great. and the world changes. And ideally, we learn to become a better man and to transform in some small way that world. That's, I think, one of the things that attracted me to Admiration Chapter was the emphasis on Masonic education, the emphasis on more like me. Anybody else? Yes. I'm, I'm curious, the, uh, the last poem that, that you read, why you chose to define it as truth versus uh, humanity? Well, I chose it, of course, part of the, the formulation from the ritual of brotherly love, relief, and truth. And the truth here is the many ways that brethren choose to recognize and comprehend the grand architect of the universe. And how all of these different visions on a topic that is contentious among men, and still is, among Freemasons, that contention needs not exist. Because all of us, even though we reach for that higher truth in somewhat different ways, are still brothers and companions together. And I felt that the, the religion aspect of this poem, particularly because it is so strikingly different from many of our experiences, kind of drove that. All of these poems express more than just one thing. All three of them, for instance, testify to brother, without a doubt. I chose to shoehorn the Kipling into truth, primarily because I felt it best exemplified that point, and used the themes of brotherly love, relief, and truth to frame the discussion. Good question, thank you. 
Anybody else? Yes? It uh, almost seems as if <coughs> the world outside has taken a giant step backwards. <coughs> and we see these brothers in India from different religions, different cultures, different castes, different military lives, etc., etc., able to come in and leave that at the door and set as brothers and smoke together after the meeting. And then I'm sure in the outside world, uh, when they met each other, they held each other in the same regard as we do as Brother Masons. Mm -hmm. To think, though, that the world seems to have deteriorated as far as tolerance, etc., etc. Incivility. Yes. So I, I, I see you know what I'm saying. So. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's reading the Kipling poem. It's also crushing at this point to then turn to something like Chris Hodak in the Journal of the Masonic Society just wrote a good piece on Freemasonry and Islam. And some of the things he had to talk about, unfortunately, were the very tenuous relationship between Freemasonry and Islam, including in the very place where Rugby Kipling was made a Mason. But there's been violence, there have been people killed, there's a formal edict of the government banning Freemasonry in Pakistan, in that place. I think the world has been going backward for just about as long as the world has been. It's one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back, but you can always point in any age to progress and to regression. There's a, we hold up the light. Yes. In Iran, there are 34 lodges in Iran, and 34 lodges are government. Mm -hmm. There's five in the United States, Los Angeles and Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and they're, they're going okay, but there's none in Iran. Right. But, you know, Freemasonry, if you take it to heart, the teachings, makes you look at yourself and other people in a different light. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the key reason for Freemasonry. And the reason why it endures, yes. despite yes. the track period. Despite, there's a reason why the Tyler symbol is what it is. Because there was a time when that had to be used or the potential for it use in, the, in a non-symbolic or real fashion. I'm thankful that it's symbolic now in most places, but ultimately there's a reason why that symbol exists. Anyone else? Could you uh, yes. enlighten us on your own education and why this is such interest to you? Well, Aside from having been a little bit of a hack poet myself when I was younger, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always liked to read in general. And I picked up a love of poetry beginning probably my seventh grade English teacher. Was fanatic about it. And she made every person in the class memorize a poem. And she assigned the poems to be memorized. And she had a really good idea of who could do what. Because some of them only did, you know, a limerick or a haiku even, but very small. She tasked me with the creation of a Negro sermon. James Weldon Johnson's greatest poem. He was a poet of the Harlem Renaissance in 20s and 30s America. And it's a story of... God and the creation, and like a mammy bending over a baby, he kneeled down in the dust. And those kinds of images told from the view of a black man of that time. Very profound, very spiritual, about 80 some odd lines. It was a bear to learn. But a teacher that would expose us to that kind of material in seventh grade. One thing I had when I came out of her class was a lot of poetry that has never subsided. Uh, my education, I'm university educated, but I never got a bachelor's degree. I never 
never finished. Mm. That's a long story. Um, but. Well, as a professor, you could be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been told a couple of times <coughs> over the years that I should have gone into either teaching or law. But, well, my, my life took different paths. And I'm perfectly happy helping out the Boy Scouts. That's what I do for a living. I run the store for the Boy Scouts and, and fairly active as a volunteer as well. Well, Professor, we've been done for a long time on this. Thank you very much. I think we need to let everybody get a chance to go home.